applied for more reasons? Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And thanks a lot, Steve, for this great introduction. I'm very honored and grateful to be here today with you, um, to be invited to give this presentation, and also as one of the grantees of the Emergence Foundation. You have no idea the amount of joy and energy that this grant brought to the team in the development of our project, and I just wanted to recognize that. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to give a presentation on a topic that's not ambitious at all, transforming culture through deep learning on climate resilience. I have about 20 minutes for that. Um, and, um, and so I just want to highlight the fact that we're essentially going to talk about how we try and transform culture as an organization working from our activities and not going into some kind of deep conceptual work on this. Um, so as Steve mentioned, I'm, I'm Laureline, I'm based in Bonn, Germany, and I run a nonprofit called One Resilient Earth. The purpose of this organization is to raise awareness and educate about the multiple impacts of climate change, including impacts that people may not have thought about too much, including on our impacts on our emotional and mental health, impacts in, that are actually enhanced by environmental racism, or that are related to sexual and gender-based violence. And we also want to build the resilience of individuals, communities, and ecosystems to address those impacts, to respond to those impacts by sharing stories and important tools that can inspire and empower people to engage into more regenerative practices. And we do it through a, a transdisciplinary approach. So we're, we weave together science, art, ancient wisdom traditions, and we bring in new technology by doing a lot of online work uh, when relevant. And um, yeah, and so for today, uh, the topic of transforming culture through deep learning on climate resilience, um, I just want to maybe mention that when we talk about transforming culture, we're not coming up with some kind of a great plan uh, by which we have already seen, seen where the world culture should be in X amount of years, and we're working towards it. Um, maybe next slide, Tim, if possible. We're actually thinking about, um, we're seeing transforming culture more as contributing to an organic and iterative process of metamorphosis. Um, we see the world as a going on together, uh, becoming together, as Bayo Akumolefe says. And so we're really working in some kind of in, you know, we're really working on an emergent, collaborative way through co-design, co-creation with multiple partners with the objective of addressing the root causes of the climate and the biodiversity crisis. That's why we would say our work is radical, like we, work, we, we want to work at the level of the root causes. But that would be a bit long for a title, so we kept transforming culture. And so um, I'm going to talk today about what's in my own... Um, personal path and career led me to um, start working on this approach and to fund this organization and how I also experienced personally the transformative power of deep learning on, trans on, on climate resilience before presenting how we try and support deep learning on climate resilience with diverse groups, but specifically with youth and, and what have been the results so far. And in conclusion, I'm just going to share a few reasons, I would say, for hope and a call to action um, for continuing to build a wider movement of radical cultural and societal metamorphosis, in case you're still hesitating about joining this work. Um, next slide, please. So how have I transformed through deep learning about climate resilience? Next. Um, so I've been working on climate resilience for a long time. I started in 2006, um, and before working for large international organizations like the French Development Agency and here at the UN Climate Change Secretariat to supporting international negotiations, I used to be working uh, with an Indian NGO in India on disaster management and reconstruction. And the positive part of working for so long on climate change and working behind the scenes, so reading reports every day and talking to a lot of people who are, who are actually exposed to the impacts of climate change directly, 
especially with this lens of climate adaptation and resilience that I was having. So I was not working on the mitigation side, not working on trying to reduce uh, the emissions that are associated with climate change, but I was working really on how we can help the people who are already affected by climate change to better prepare for those impacts, to cope with the impact, to limit the impacts in different ways, and how can we anticipate those impacts so that they are not as severe, as critical on the population. So the good thing of working on this side of, of uh, the equation or on this side of, of the work is that you get to develop a pretty deep understanding of what the climate crisis is about. Um, and two of the most important realizations I got um, through this work, um, so next slide, working with um, yeah, a, a wide variety of people, especially in those contexts, which are very formal institutional contexts, is that one, uh, climate change is definitely an existential risk, so there is no denying about it. Um, it's already affecting a lot of people for whom, you know, climate change is not just like one heat wave that feels severe that may bring some death. Um, but it's, it's really a reality that's already contributing to massive population displacement, that's contributing to increase in diseases, to death also uh, because of storms or droughts or floods. Um, and to increased um, yeah, sexual violence for groups that are displaced, essentially like girls and women. So this is, this is real, this is massive. Um, and, and in addition to that, it has really the potential for massive ecological collapse. Um, and when you keep reading you know, report after report, where projections are like dire enough, but usually empirical studies, so what's happening on the ground is worse than what's in the report, you get pretty serious about, the, about this crisis. And, you, and, and through my work, I also realized that we're unlikely to really solve the climate crisis, and certainly not with, with the mindset within the system and with the tools that contributed to create it in the first place. Um, so in addition to those realizations, Next slide, please. Um, I, by the point I got to those realizations, I would say I was pretty deep into eco-anxiety, uh, depression, uh, with occasional suicidal ideation. Um, I was feeling totally overwhelmed. I was living with constant fear. I was trying to work my way through it. Like, maybe if I do more, you know, I'll be feeling better. didn't work at all. Never a good thing to do <laughs> when you're feeling bad already. Uh, they didn't really know about it. People were not really talking about climate change and mental health at this time, like, ten, like five to ten years ago. It was not as uh, talked about, even though today it's still not that much, but almost nothing at that point. And so I, I really engaged in an additional, what I would call the deeper learning journey, like going inside and trying to look at those fears. And, and the overwhelm, and understand you know, both why that, that was so heavy to bear, and how I could develop tools to deal with this overwhelm and this fear. Um, I looked at psychology, I looked beyond it, I went into looking at different uh, philosophies, I discovered Thich Nhat Hanh and mindfulness and Buddhism, and I looked at Eastern medicine, and I looked at somatics, and I looked at indigenous people's knowledge, and I found different teachers and help and support along the way. And so the very positive thing that went through this very, like those big mental health challenges, was that I could find a number of tools that could be helpful, that helped me go through this. And I also found a very different way of looking at the climate crisis. Um, so it was no longer, you know, uh, a limited, like a problem to be solved that was a result of industrialization. I really started seeing it as both the symptom and the accelerator of a deeper ecological crisis that stems from a vision of the earth and all living beings as resources to tap. And so it became a relational crisis. It, it was related to the way we relate to ourselves, to others, to all living beings, and to ecosystems. And it totally shifted the way I could approach working with or in response to the ecological crisis. 
um, with this idea that, yeah, we really needed to address those root causes, the mindsets that were uh, underlying this crisis, and that there was a lot to do with a more regenerative approach, so an approach that protects life, that fosters life, the life of ecosystem, the life of communities, and that we would not achieve any kind of resilience, we would not be able to go through this crisis unless we worked on yeah, revitalizing and, and fostering life uh, along the way. Next. And so that's how we got the idea to create one regime at Earth, to get more people to join in. This, this approach was engaging. Some people wanted to learn more about how to deal with the crisis. So we came about with this approach. Next, please. And we were, and then we engaged in a bigger discussions with a few like-minded people who were interested in this project on how could large groups of people, including youth, engage in deep learning on climate resilience. Uh, next, please. So we were really wanting to reach out different people who were already impacted and who were likely to get more impacted in the future. So this included youth, sustainability professionals, including in the arts and culture sector, critically impacted communities, climate conscious and climate curious citizens. And we don't see them just as vulnerable groups. We see them as actual co-creators and partners in the design of all the projects that we do. Next, please. We have an approach that's like an ecosystem. Like we try to have different projects that support each other and that complement each other so that with those different projects and approaches, like this whole ecosystem of projects thrives a bit more. So one is the resilience nest. So it's a virtual and nomadic learning and community space for climate resilience. Next, please. It's a, it provides a community space to talk freely about the impacts of climate change on our lives, as well as to learn about, co-create and experience with transformative and regenerative solutions to build resilience to art, future thinking, mindfulness, and collaborative activities in a positive and inclusive environment. Next, please. Uh, we have weekly climate worker circles and news climate circles. Uh, we're going to have one this afternoon, so you can actually experience it a little uh, to support the emotional health of students, professionals. We also provide live online courses on futures literacy and the arts for transformative climate action. And we also have, next please, a course called Flourish, which is the one that we developed with the support of the Emergence Foundation which is a youth learning journey of resilience and regeneration. Uh, it's for people between 18 and 28 years of age, starts next September, and we bring together basically the different uh, tools and stories that can inspire people uh, towards change through uh, with an online community, art and storytelling. Next, please. We also have performances and exhibitions. We work with poets, we worked with um, artist collectives, including in Berlin, and we also organize listening sessions with indigenous leader and knowledge holders. Next. We have a magazine called Tero. Next, uh, where we actually bring together the voices of artists, scientists, community members from around the world to expand imagination and build resilience to many different futures. Next. We also work directly with communities um, with through our tapestry program. Next, please. The idea is really to support long-term transformation of local communities towards resilience by facilitating learning, co-creation, and experimentation with regenerative solutions, and by accompanying changes in individual and collective identities. Next. One community is based in Canada, where we work on a new narrative on green recovery and long-term climate resilience uh, with many different community members, including indigenous leaders. And we covered topics ranging from eco-anxiety, basic needs, economic relocalization, climate migration. And uh, the foundings were disseminated across Atlantic Canada. Next. We worked with a community in Uganda around um, Regenerative, re regenerative agriculture with young women and girls. Uh, we also have, we're actually catalyzing support towards that community, like financial, technical support. And we're just starting working with them on the nexus between climate change, displacement, and sexual and gender-based violence with a great organization called Mutera Global Healing. Next, please. 
And just a new project we've started, we're very excited about, um, is with um, Oakwood, the Oakwood Center for Future Thinking in the UK, an initiative and a collaborative partner in the Philippines called Green Relief. And it's called Restory Living Cultural Landscapes in a Changing Climate. So we're working with art and storytelling on how our connection to the land and to traditional ecological knowledge can help us build more climate resilient and regenerative futures. And we're going to work with artists and feedback those discussions into the climate negotiation process at the end of the project. Next, please. And the last part of our work is through collaborations with different organizations for transformation. Next, please. Uh, we're collaborating with organizations and groups who are committed to supporting transformation, resilience, and regeneration in the way that they operate, through the work they do, or through advocacy, uh, so as to respond to the climate emergency. Next. We've had co-creations, including with the University of Bonn, through a, an art science lecture series on ecology and the metamorphosis of modern society. We facilitated panel discussions uh, with researchers, artists, and indigenous knowledge holders. Next, please. We give in-person trainings, uh, including with young people working from climate anxiety to resilience, creativity, and connection, bringing in like, theater and performance artists. We did that one with the UNFCCC Secretariat. We run visioning exercises. We had a very exciting one on the future of healing in a changing climate with the Encourage Museum in the US. And we do those public talks, uh, essentially for the follow-up, for the time of collaboration we can actually build as a result of those. Next, please. Uh, so which results and new questions have emerged uh, from the first projects? Next, please. So the early results, essentially when we worked with the climate circle participants, which are like open sharing, deep listening circles, you'll have the opportunity to engage in one this afternoon if you want to get a feel of what it is, is that the participants feel uh, seen, heard, understood, supported, and empowered. For our circle participants and also our trainees, we have an increase in imagination, creativity, daring, some entrepreneurship, they engage more towards their own emotional, mental health and well-being, and they have, many have said they regain a sense of excitement, joy, and curiosity. And at the community level, we've seen more engagement in regenerative agriculture and ecosystem restoration activities. Next, please. And the new questions that have come up for us is like how, looking at those very positive and exciting results, like how can we harness more support for other diverse, compassionate, and creative learning and doing communities that are excited about building the resilience of individuals, communities, and ecosystems through regeneration? How can we ensure that the transformation from the inside out is continuously fed from the outside in? Because this learning has to be continuous, and we need to, of course, integrate any kind of feedback and, and the climate change in any way, constantly changing the environment we have to work with. And how can we best align our actions with our words when we're talking about radical transformation? You know, where it's not just about consuming a little less or recycling, but what does that mean in terms of how we live and work and organize? Next, please. Um, and in addition to those questions, which I'd love to hear from you about, and, and I'd love to engage in conversations about, um, I'd like to share with you why we feel we could achieve a radical cultural and, and societal transformation. So what are the hopes that drive us along the way? Next, please. So we have a few ideas. Um, one is that change is happening right now, like climate change is happening. You felt it. More and more people are feeling it, whether we like it or not. And we're going to have to work with this new reality, to work in this new climate-altered world, and we hope that as more people feel it, which unfortunately we had to go to this point, then more action is going to be taken. Um, we also know that we have a lot to win and little to lose through climate adaptation and resilience in terms of health and well-being, in terms of the climate change mitigation could benefit, meaning when we restore ecosystems, they can also sequester more carbon, and so you can actually have an impact in terms of limiting the rise in, in uh, carbon emissions. We can, it can help in terms of biodiversity restoration, which we need acutely at the moment. 
and social cohesion and care. We also know that we're not alone. Like there are more and more people realizing the importance of working through, you know, at, at the root level in terms of addressing the climate and the biodiversity crisis. And we're always stunned to see how many young people want to engage in our work and support the work we do and do more. Um, and we feel that as local and also transnational communities of support emerge, we could experience some virtual circles. So instead of uh, having this, um, this climate tipping points by which we're, we are risking to, to live in a very uninhabitable earth, we could actually help trigger social tipping points, meaning points by which all these efforts that we're doing at the moment through lots of hard work and lots of determination could actually spread out to society at large. So that's about it. Next slide, please. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and happy to take any questions now or even afterwards if you want to. Thank you. So um, I, I'm going to uh, initially just open a question with Laureline, um, and uh, then we're going to open it to the floor for anybody um, who's got questions, comments uh, that they'd like to share. Um, that would be fantastic. So, um, okay, great. Um, so anyway, Laureline, um, I guess the first thing I wanted to say is I'm sort of overwhelmed by the amount that you're actually doing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's like quite bewildering. I mean, you know, that, that you, you've taken on so many different aspects of, of how to respond to the climate emergency. Um, and I, I, I love the word resilience. I think it's a, it's a great word that you've chosen because it, it feels like that is what we really need in order to kind of confront this crisis. Um, so um, I have a lot of questions I could ask you, <laughs> but I'll try and sort of limit it just to uh, opening something up here. Um, one thing I think I know I would like to know more about and, and probably imagine other people would too, is, um, is if you could give some examples in a way of like your work with young people particularly because, um, you know, in my own experience of just thinking about the climate crisis, it's, it's, it's young people and the next generation and so forth that is really comes sort of first to my mind as kind of the future and um, what it's like for young people to be growing up in a world um, where we have no idea whether we're going to have a future. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I, I think it would be really interesting to know from you, because you've been working with youth, and um, exploring different ways of building resilience in them. Um, just could you give some examples of the work that you're doing and the impact and how it affects young people, what kind of impact it has on them, what does that lead to, uh, just in your own experience. Um, mm -hmm. That would be really good to hear a little bit more about that. Sure. Yes, yeah, so... Um I think in the very beginning, we're not thinking of targeting youth particularly, like because the impacts are happening and everywhere, but it became very clear through our first activities that young people were really coming to the front with lots of definitely eco-anxiety, climate anxiety that I can totally relate with, a very clear understanding of what was going on in terms of the dynamics at play, uh, the global source, global north dynamic, climate injustice issues, um, and, and so we thought to work with them in two, in two ways. I think the first one was that in addition to having our climate worker circles, so which were like open sharing, deep listening circles where people can talk freely about all the emotions that they, they, they face sorry, in, in confronting the climate crisis or in doing their own work, including through activism, we developed a youth climate circle so where only young people could come together 
and they have their own safe space to talk about those, those emotions. And they felt that this space was very welcome because there were like, there are a few spaces existing, but this one is open to all. It can be accessed for free. You can reach it out online. And so they felt that they were building the kind of small community of support that they needed, and they felt more acknowledged and empowered with their own emotion, that there was a space where you could speak the truth without uh, feeling like you were the odd one, in a way. And But in addition to having this space, that's why we developed this more in in more holistic um, climate learning journey. So we're working on it at the moment, so I don't have lots of impacts to tell you about, but we did a, a big co-design process with them where it was really the idea of like, what do you need in addition to just having this space? So it was about how, that the tools they could use to build um, their own inner resilience to climate anxiety. It was also about imagining more positive future, like how can you expand your own imagination to think about desirable futures, uh, what it would look like. Then it's also about staying with the trouble and the not knowing and the interdependency that can sometimes be overwhelming. And then it's, it's also changing the paradigm to working on um, addressing this relational crisis I was talking about. So how can we work on climate change by more care, by developing caring relationships to ourselves, to our communities, to our ecosystem, what would it look like, and how would it translate in terms of actions. And so that's, that's what came out of our conversation, and that's what they felt was most needed, and there was already quite a lot of excitement and joy in the development of this curricula and the selection of speakers, and, um, and so, yeah, that's what we're working on. And, and are you finding that, that um, as you're working with building this resilience, um, that it's leading to the, these young people kind of like feeling that they can act, take action, do things themselves to, to contribute, to make a change themselves in different ways. I just mm. was wondering how, if that's also part of it, I mean, because obviously part of it is also just dealing with the feelings, mm -hmm. and then there's also what can they actually do to contribute, to get involved, and I'm just wondering how that... Sure. Well, first, I'd like to say that many young people are already active, like they're already yeah, doing they it. They already are. <laughs> yeah. So for many of them, it's more like dealing with like the, the overwhelm, both right. of uh, the amount of work they're putting in, because they're doing lots of work through activism, through local organizing, just because they're, they're facing this crisis often head on and they're, they don't, they're not looking for escape. So they're already doing a lot. And so it's almost more like burnout cases, so like it's kind of like work-related trauma that, that comes uh, through. And for the ones who don't really know what to do, I mean, we have some people approaching us like, I don't know, this is too big. Then, yes, we try to, to provide ways by which they can have, a, they have this whole palette or like whole variety of actions they can take in a way that feel aligns with them, in a way they don't burn themselves out and that they keep, you know, the energy to engage more and to keep learning and they have the support they need for that. Fantastic. Um, there are, I mean, I, there are so many different aspects to the work you're doing and I realize the youth aspect is just one of them because there's a lot there. Um, so um, I think we'll open it up to the floor now mm -hmm. um, for anybody who has questions, comments for Laureline. Um, and let's see how we get on. I'm, I, I have other questions too, but let's open it up to the floor and uh, I'd love to um, hear what people think and uh, questions you might have. Thank you. Well, my name is Fumadi. Hi. Um, I'm very impressed by your story. It, it's very touching and um, really deep. I'm. Uh, really touched by that. But I was thinking, um, you experienced this climate depression, so to speak, and um, you experienced it as a, an individual. You were very alone in it. And in what you built up, I see that the answer lies in the collective. Because, and, and I was wondering if you could say more about that. Yes, uh, yeah, thank you for, for your comment. Um, yeah, I was definitely very alone. Um, and I realized that if only I had had a community <laughs> at this point, it would have been so different. 
And if only people had listened, were willing to listen, because I was feeling all those emotions. I was feeling all this overwhelm, all this fear, and I couldn't bring it up. I couldn't bring it up in the workplace. Nobody was talking about it. I felt it was almost affecting my kind of professional um, standing, like I was not supposed to express my emotions in the workplace. And even at home or like with families, like you don't want to burden them with that. You don't know what to do with those emotions, like they're so big. And there was a real lack of community at that point for me because you don't necessarily need like medical help. You know, sometimes you just need to be heard and, and just people to acknowledge, you know, what you're feeling. And, and so that's something that I felt we could also do, you know, as an organization. Like, okay, maybe we're not psychologists, maybe, but at least we can provide this kind of first, like, in a way, almost a safety net, like a, a place where people can come and they're going to be listened to and we're going to acknowledge that, yeah, that we feel it too, you know, and this is real and this is happening and we need to develop, there's something beyond that. I think we need to develop this ability to stay with those feelings and those emotions if we really want to come to a more radical way to address this crisis. If we can't stand those emotions, we'll never get deep enough to think in a, in a transformative way. And, and that was important, that we try to do it at least. Thank you. Thank you, Laureen. I was also very impressed by your um, talk. And I have one very practical question. Um, do you do some, maybe you even mentioned it, but I didn't, I missed it, like train the trainer, like uh, so that there will be like an, a way of doing franchising into other countries or other places, or I mean, I personally would be interested in doing that. Yeah, for us, it's the next step. <laughs> like this is what we'd like to do, of course. Like right now, we're filled with like very much learning and experimenting as responsibly as possible and trying out, but we'd love that. I mean, we'd love to work with other organizations or individuals who get help. I mean, we don't own the concept of a climate circle, like we tried it out and we need it so much that anybody who wants to you know, learn how we do it, wants to try it out, we're super happy to share what we know and to help set it up. Is this? Oh, yeah. Okay, wonderful. So um, there's something I feel I've been hearing between the lines of what you said, and I'm not sure if it's there or not, but maybe you can speak about it, uh, which for me, what occurs to me is that you're using the words uh, deep, deep learning, deep listening, and uh, uh, circles. And for me, this all is about sort of spaciousness and slowing down almost. And I would imagine that with your history of coming from the UN and now your own organization, you you sort of you taken the speed out of things maybe a bit and i i'm just wondering what you feel about this this sort of paradox that's there with in a way immediate action is required for climate change and at the same time people just running around with busy hats and making quick decisions without slowing down and going deep is not going to necessarily be the best way forward so i'm i'm curious what you have to say about that Thanks a lot for this one. Yeah, there, it, there's a quote that's coming to my mind it's from Bayo Akumolefe, and, and he says, times are urgent, let us slow down. And I love this quote. And I think that what, what you're saying, yeah, definitely something that was important to us in the sense that in, in, the, in the speeding up, in the urgency, the worst thing we could do is continue to reproduce a system that in itself contributes to the degeneration of the biosphere and to a host of of ecological problems that, that it won't fix because of the way it's designed. So there is this importance of slowing down or maybe like zooming out, you know, and looking at how all the system and the, the mindsets are operating in order to take a more critical view of what, are, what is at fault, you know, why are we not succeeding? Because there have been climate negotiations for 30 years, you know, like we've been producing text after text after text and the idea, well, we just need political will, mm -mm. Well, I mean, it's, it's beyond that. To me, there is something beyond in like, why are we not acting on this crisis? What's keeping us from it? Does it have to do with the pain and the overwhelm that we feel when we really connect to it? In fact, people don't really want to be in that space and that's legitimate like you don't want to be impacted <laughs> for sure but even even the people who are not feeling it don't even want to think about it 
and may not want to change as much as is required. So taking this take back and, and slowing down this this space of like, let's do more report and let's do more action and let's do more of this and that is not necessarily going to cut it because we need something yeah, more transformative on a larger scale. Um, and that requires a bit of slowing down, at least temporarily, or at least at times, I would say, like even in the day, taking time just to stop and reflect on what you've done is essential, I feel, for this transformation we want to achieve. Probably got time for one more question. Okay. I can take more after <laughs> if you want. <laughs> yeah, wonderful work you're doing, uh, Laura Lee. Um, I was curious because there's a kind of flawed cultural critique of eco anxiety climate process as being the kind of privilege of the middle class. Uh, and I'm, I'm interested in what you've encountered that. Uh, is opposite to that and how you respond to that um, critique of this is just for wealthy people complaining kind of thing. Yeah. Um, well, that, there are different levels of eco-anxiety. I mean, it, like eco-anxiety sounds different in different places, for sure. Um, I, I mean, I've... I'm in, in contact with people from very different areas, especially when I think like I have conversations with activists or community organizers or social workers in India or the Philippines or Bangladesh. The type of fear that they're having is much more you know, related to actual trauma they've experienced through flooding, that they may have lost already a lot, they may have been displaced, or they may be dealing with like extremely hard cases of yeah, whole groups of population being displaced, women experiencing rape, you know, so it's different, different type of trauma and climate anxiety that you're dealing with. Doesn't sound like yeah, what young people from a middle class background in Europe may express, where they have this mix of I'm very afraid for my future, and some of them, like, I, I wish I were going to have the same life as my parents. It's not going to happen. So, you, you, I mean, I understand where the critique comes from, but I have to say that the emotional and mental health impacts of climate change are everywhere, and, of course, more severe in different countries, and we're also trying to work on that through this project on sexual and gender-based violence, like on the traumas and and the mental health impacts, both, of course, for the people who've experienced the violence, but for the people who are helping them, so that they'll be able to help them better. Hmm. Lots of people want to ask questions. Maybe we can have one more. But Laureline, you're going to be here yeah. for the rest of the day, so there will be lots more opportunities. Thank you. Yes, I also have a background in environmental science and work in the arts now, poetry particularly, and mindfulness as well. So I relate to a lot of what you're saying. And, and I truly believe there's a, whole, there's a whole new way of thinking, a whole different lens that we need to look through in order to solve this crisis. And I guess, how do we engage the majority, not just the periphery? Because I, sti I still find that people that come to do workshops and things that people have already got some awareness but then the majority of people are particularly hard to reach and it's interesting you're talking about middle class but you know um, ethnic minority and working class people it's still very difficult to reach them to think that there is even a problem so I just wondered I mean in, you know you're talking about cultural change and I guess with cultural change we've got to engage the majority and I guess that's my question how you reach people who are not already, um, you know, on the periphery that are aware. Yeah, um, I mean, of course, I mean, the thing is that depending on the countries where you're looking or the groups you're looking at, like the majority may be already, you know, very much focused on it. Like if we support people in, um, in Uganda, or if we work with communities in the Philippines, it's, it's, not, it's no longer just like a, a, a peripheral topic, like the impacts of climate change are everywhere. Um, now, if we're looking at there's this recurrent question that I have, but you're, you're only working with the people who are already somehow uh, interest, but interested by the topic or doing things about the topic. Um, I, I 
personally feel in the work of the organizations. Like we feel like working with those who have the energy and the desire to do this work and be public about the work that they do and talk about the work they do is going to have an effect in the sense that we we only work here yeah, with the climate curious or with the, the climate concerned, we could say, voluntarily, not because we we don't think the other are not important, but just because we feel it's the way of like, you know, I don't know, it's, it's going to spread through conversations by showing some of the work, like working with artists is also a great way. To, when we had exhibitions in a certain um, area of, of Berlin, which is Kreuzberg, in, an, in a neighborhood that peop where people may not really care about this topic as much, uh, having this exhibition, which is open to all, or we can talk about it. It's an art exhibition. It doesn't say climate change specifically on it, but it, it's just a different way of opening conversations. I think we feel like opening new conversations and having people willing to open conversations and not react in, in polarized ways or not making divides can help over time. It's not perfect, but that's what we're trying to do. just wanted to thank you so much, Laureline, for your fantastic work uh, and the presentation. And thank everybody for the, uh, also great questions and answers. And a lot of things opened up there. So thank you so much. Thank you.